Hey y'all, hope y'all are having a good day. I thought for today what we would do is look at this state space problem because y'all know I like state space. So let's look at this one and we'll work through it and see what we get. All right, so it says we've got a system. It's represented by this state space representation. So remember, for just our general notation, this first matrix will be matrix A. This is going to be matrix B and then we'll call this one C. All right, and we don't have a matrix D. Sometimes you'd have a matrix D, but we're not going to have that in this problem. All right, so we've got that, and let's see what it says. So it wants us to find the output time response. Okay, so that's what we're looking for, and it wants to know what type of response it is. So another question, and then as T goes to infinity, what's going to be the value of the output time response? All right, so we're going to find basically three different things here. So first thing we need to do is get an equation here. And the equation that we need is going to help us get the transfer function, right? That's what I need first. Because if I have the transfer function, I'm going to be able to use that to get this output time response. And remember what this is wanting. So if I've got x dot here, this is going to be the derivative of my output. All right, u of t is my input function. This will be the derivative of the output. So what I want when we're talking about this, I want x of t. Okay, so I want an equation for x that's a function of time. And that's why it's, you know, output and then time response. So that's what we are looking for. So if y'all remember, if you've watched uh, some of my other videos, or if you take my online classes, we know that x of s over u of s has to equal matrix C times s i minus a inverse, so that whole thing's in the parentheses, take the inverse, and then we multiply that by b. Okay, so we've got output over input equals this equation, and remember, output over input, that also gives us the transfer function g. All right, so we get g of s from that. So that's what we want, we want to do. I want to get um, my transfer function here because then I will be able to use that and get x. All right, so let's do that first. So let's focus in on what's in the brackets here. So I need s i minus a. Remember s is just the variable s. i is the identity matrix. a is this matrix right here. So let's do this first. All right, and let's do the s i part. So remember it's just s times the identity matrix. It's going to be a two by two identity matrix because that's the dimensions we have here. So we're going to have s, 0, 0, and s. Then we're going to subtract a, which is right here. And then let's see what we get there. So that is going to be s minus 0, which obviously is s. 0 minus negative 2, so positive 2. 0 minus 1, so negative 1. And then s minus negative 3, so that's going to be s plus 3. And we want to take the inverse of this, okay? Now, I don't know about y'all, but I always use a graphing calculator to do this, just because it's easier, all right? So I would just use a calculator to calculate this. Um, if you don't have a calculator that can do that, you can do it by hand. It's just going to take you a little bit longer. All right, so if we take this, do the inverse, let's see what we get. So let's write out this again. Okay, so we're taking the inverse of that. If you do that in the calculator, what you're going to get, you're going to get four elements. All right, so it's going to be a two by two again, but this time you're going to have fractions. This first one here, you're going to have s plus three in the numerator, and then the denominator, you're going to have s squared plus three s plus two. All right, and we're going to have the same denominator for all four terms. So if you wanted, you could pull out the one over the s squared here and then just put the numerators um, if you want. That's a little bit easier to write, but I'm gonna write it like this just so it's obvious what we've got. So this element here is gonna be negative two over that same polynomial. And then we're gonna have one over that polynomial. And then finally, we're gonna have S. Just like that. Okay, so that's gonna be the inverse. 
And now what we need to do, we've got the inverse. So we've got this part done. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to multiply it by B. All right, because remember when we have this set up right here, you want to do these two first. Multiply these first. Then once you have that result, we'll multiply here by C. All right, so let's rewrite this. So let's just recopy it. And then we can multiply. Okay, so there's that. That was our inverse. Now we're going to multiply by B. So what matrix would we have for B? Well, remember, it's just going to be this one right here. It's a little column vector. So we're going to multiply by 1 and 0. Well, that's pretty easy, right? Because this one is 0, so that's good. So with this one, we're going to end up with another column vector. And the first element will be this one, because remember, we're going to do this times 1 plus this times 0. So this last product goes away, so we just end up with this one first. All right. And then we do the same thing for down here. So now we're going to have this one times 1 plus this one times 0. So our result then will just be this fraction here. Okay, so now we've got this. So now we've taken care of that product right there. So now all I have to do is go and multiply C by this matrix. All right, so C is a row vector, right? It's 1 and 0. And then we want to multiply it by this. And Fortunately, we have a zero there, so it makes it a little easier. So now we've got one times this plus zero times this. So we're left with this top one, which makes sense because I only want, in this case, one transfer function, right? So I've got s plus 3 over s squared plus 3s plus 2. So this right here is going to be our x over u, which is also g, okay? So you can put this as x of s over u of s, but it's also g of s. So now what we want is x of t, right? So I've got x of s, which is basically the Laplace transform of x of t. So I need to figure out how to get x of t from what we've got here. So can you all think of how we could do that? Well, what if we use an input here? multiply it by g of s, and then we'll have an equation for x of s. And then we can use that one to get x of t. So let's do that. And in this problem, let's just say we have a step input, just because that's usually what um, I use in class. So let's just say you know we have 1 over s, because it's a step input. And let's take that, plug it in here. We're going to multiply it by g. So that means x of s then is going to be s plus 3 over this polynomial. And then remember, I'm multiplying it by this unit step, right? So we're going to end up with an s down here in the denominator. Now, hopefully, y'all are still with me. So now I've got this. This is x of s. So this is the Laplace transform of x of t. So now I need to figure out how to get x of t. Well, anytime we see something like this, we want to get x of t, we know we have to do the inverse Laplace. Okay, but we want to simplify this first. The easiest way to do that will be partial fractions. So if we look at this, let's, let's look at this little polynomial here. I can break this down. And I know s plus 2 times s plus 1 gives me this polynomial, right? So knowing that, that means I can set this fraction here to a over s plus b over s plus 2 plus c over s plus 1. 
All right, so we're just taking each of these terms in the denominator, creating a fraction. A, B, and C are things we're going to have to solve for. So now this is just kind of a partial fractions problem at this point um, until we get to the end. And then we'll take the inverse Laplace. So what we're going to do is focus on basically the numerator here. And we're going to write S plus 3 from up here. And then we're essentially doing common denominators over here. All right, so the common denominator um, for this problem is going to have to be S times S plus 2 times S plus 1. So think of getting common denominators here for all three of these. And what would you have up top when you do that? All right, so for A here, we've got S on the bottom. So if I was getting a common denominator, I'd have to multiply by S plus 2 and S plus 1, right? So that means I'm going to have A times S plus 2 times S plus 1. And then for this one, we're missing the S and the S plus 1 here in the denominator. So we're going to have B times S times S plus 1. And then for C, what do y'all think we'd have? Well, we're missing S and S plus 2, so let's put those. All right. So remember, all this is is just getting the common denominator over here. That's all we are doing. We're just focusing in on the numerators, though, because that's where A, B, and C are. So now we can go through and find A, B, and C. And the easiest way to do that is just to pick um, three easy to use S values. And we're going to use three because I have three unknowns. So I need three equations to solve. So let's let S equal zero first because that will be easy to use here and here. So we'll say S is zero. And then everywhere we see S, we're going to plug in a zero. So we've got three. It's going to equal A times two times one. And then over here, B times zero. So this whole term is going to go away. So let's just put zero there. And then same thing here. So we'll have C times zero. So now we can solve for A. And we get 3 over 2, which is 1.5. And then we're going to do the same thing for the other two. All right, so now let's switch to a different value for S. So if I used negative 2, that would make this one go to 0 and this. So let's use that. All right, so here I'm going to have negative 2 plus 3, which is 1. And then we're going to have A times 0 because we had negative 2 plus 2. That goes away. And then over here I'm going to have plus B times negative 2 times negative 2 plus 1, which is negative 1. And then finally here, C times negative 2, but then we have times negative 2 plus 2, which this term goes to 0. So this will be C times 0. All right, so this goes away, this goes away. B's are one unknown, so we can solve for B. And we get 0 0.5. And then last one, let's do negative 1 because that'll make this one and this one go to zero. So that'll be easy. So negative one plus three is positive two. We're gonna have it equal to A times zero, essentially, because this one here goes to zero. Same thing over here. The negative one is gonna take this term to zero. So we'll have plus B times zero. And then finally over here, we'll have C times negative one times one. All right, so these go away, leaves us with C. So C then is going to be negative 2. Okay, so now we've pretty much done all of the hard stuff. So now what we're going to have to do is rewrite our fractions using A, B, and C. So let's do that, and then we'll go from there. All right, so remember this is still X of S. So X of S then is going to be 1.5 over S. And then we're going to have plus 0.5 over s plus 2. And then negative 2 over uh, s plus 1. All right, so now what do we do? 
Well, now I need to get rid of S. I need to switch it to T, right? So now we're going to take the inverse Laplace. And this is where you would use that Laplace table. These fractions you might be able to do without the table if you've done these enough times, because these are used quite a bit, so you might have these kind of memorized. But what we would have when we do the inverse Laplace of the left side, the inverse Laplace of x of s is going to give us x of t. Notice that's what we wanted, right? That's going to be the output time response here when we find the right side. So the next one we have 1.5 over s. So anytime you have a value over just s, the inverse Laplace of that is just the value up top. And we know that from this table. All right, so this is the table I always use. I think it's from an old version of like the Ogata book. Um, but 1 over s is what we see here, so it's just basically going to be the value that's up top in the numerator. Okay, so we got 1.5. Next for this one, we've got 0.5 over s plus 2. All right, so kind of ignore that 0.5 right now. We'll take care of that in just a second. So I want something that's got the form 1 over s plus 2. So let's look at this. And that looks similar to this, right? So a here for us is going to be 2. So if we look over here, this is what we get when we do the inverse Laplace. So I should get e to the negative 2t. All right. Now I've got that 0.5 though, so I can't forget about that. So we're going to have plus 0.5 times e to the negative 2t. And then last one, we got negative 2 over s plus 1. What do y'all think that will be? It's going to have the same form, right? Because it's still the form s plus a in the denominator. So with that one, we're going to have negative 2 times e to the negative t. And that will be our output time response. So now we can plug in different times and we can figure out what the output is at that time. Or you could take this, you could plot it in Excel or MATLAB, whatever you want to do. Um, and you can see a plot of it versus time. But this is the output time response. All right, and that's how we went through and found it. Now it also asked what type of response it is and then it wants to know what will be the value of the output time response as t goes to infinity. Okay. Well, when it asks what type of response it is, it wants to know if it's underdamped, undamped, um, critically damped, or overdamped. So in this case, I've got two exponential terms. All right. So remember the exponential terms provide damping, right? So when we have it like this, when they're both just exponential terms, none of them are multiplied by t, that means we're going to have an overdamped system. So let's put overdamped because two uh, exponential terms. All right, so we've got that. And then, last thing, the value when t goes to infinity. So anytime we have these exponentials to the negative t, remember the plot of that is going to look something like this, right? So notice it's coming down here. It's going to come down and it's basically going to go to zero. So both of these terms here are going to go to zero as t goes to infinity. So let's write that out. All right, so this is going to go to zero, and then this goes to zero. So that leaves us with 1.5. So that's the value we would get as t goes to infinity. All right. So hopefully that one makes sense, and you can see how to take the state space representation and break it down to get um, your x of t or your output time response. All right. Hope y'all enjoyed that one. I will see y'all next time for another video.